Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be the host for this session. My name is Tom Ullman, and I am a venture capitalist, and I have, uh, but not in the uh, impact investing area. So I'm here, I'd say, also as a student to learn from many of you and from our two other uh, panelists here. I have a background in um, uh, education and worked previously as an academic on race relations issues and in the nonprofit arena I have uh, quite extensive experience uh, with uh, Planned Parenthood in the New York City area I'm the board chair of the largest Planned Parenthood in the country affiliate um, and a food one of the large food banks in the state of New Jersey that delivered 220,000 meals a day during the pandemic and have spent a fair amount of time in the last few years giving back uh, in a, a world that has been very, very uh, generous to me through the course of my career. Uh, and I am very happy to introduce our two panelists to you who can will tell you a bit about themselves, Tim Ran and Mira Shiva, and uh, let them introduce themselves, and we'll get started. Okay, I'm uh, Mira Shiva. I'm with the Habitat for Humanity, and uh, we work on a fund called the Shelter Venture Fund, which does impact investments on uh, housing-related innovations. It's a global fund. We have made uh, 12 investments so far globally, uh, and it's an in-house fund, so it's on our balance sheet, so we don't have a certain number of years by which we need to exist, so it's a lot of patient capital. The investment sizes are pretty small. We come in early in the seed stage, about 300 to 500K is our ticket size, and yeah, I mean, our sector focus includes building material, building technologies and digital solutions, water and sanitation, um, and uh, renewable energy solutions for housing. Hi, everybody. My name is Timothy Ran. I'm managing partner at Marie Score Ventures. Uh, we are an emerging markets-focused venture capital fund. Um, we are focused on two specific outcomes uh, as an impact fund. First is climate resilience, and second is financial resilience, two things obviously very intertwined. Uh, investing really across South America uh, or Latin America as a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, sectors of focus are ag tech, fin tech, uh, and climate tech, although we've done a few investments in property tech, which housing would fit within, um, and a few other sectors like last mile distribution and logistics. Yeah. Great. Um, I think a big picture question to put out on the table for us is, um, why housing is important uh, to Habitat and Mercy Corps and uh, how uh, the linkages that we see existing between um, housing and other important factors that um, uh, matter in terms of uh, economic, social, and health uh, benefits to people in our society and I guess focus primarily on the uh, so-called base of the pyramid, people who've been less fortunate than probably all of us in this room. Uh, and I guess why should it start off with why should impact investors care about housing? So I turn it over to you, Mira, for your thoughts. Right. So. I think if you are an impact investor, you need to provide whatever is the fund's mandate, uh, both the financial return and the impact return that you set out to uh, do, right? So it could be like, you know, providing livelihoods or, you know, creating jobs or whatever is it that the fund's mandate is. Um, and I think if you are in, in the impact sector, while getting financial returns in, in the general space is a little easier it's not easy as, you know, so many of the startups fail and whatnot. Relatively, uh, trying to go for this double bottom line return, you will find that with 
after the very easy um, uh, uh, things are solved, like uh, financial inclusion sort of issues are a little easy with microfinance and others, when you go, drill down one more layer, you find that many of the issues are interconnected. When you try to solve education as a problem, you will find, well, why are education outcomes poor? That may be related to uh, there is no stable livelihood or you know other issues in that community. And I think housing is, is one where all these factors sort of come together and in some sense solving housing as a problem will help address all these other allied issues like health outcomes, you know, it is related to livelihoods and, and climate change, which is a, a big issue and, and becoming bigger by the day. So um, I think housing is, is one area which is not one vertical, it's more a horizontal that sort of cuts across these different impact goals and different impact investors can add that housing lens to their investments to say to see where are the intersections of where theirs meet and there is also the housing element right like you know instead of any financial inclusion uh, a housing microfinance loan or a you know housing renovation um, loan or you know um, making your house more resilient to hurricanes and whatnot or any of these climate issues uh, and insurance others to those are a financial solution which also has that housing base. So that's where I feel investors can play a role in uh, including housing in their portfolio. Very good. One, one, um, one of your investments, um, Earth Enable, I think is a, a good example. Maybe you could just mention what, how Earth Enable combines some of these benefits. Right. So Earth Enable is a um, company based in uh, Rwanda. And they do earthen floors with the you know, newer material. And there is a lot of health benefit outcomes from not having a dirt floor and having this uh, flooring. And that is, you know, also improving the quality of housing for people. And, you know, here is, you know, as uh, Tom uh, nicely pointed out, he is, you know, one of our uh, board of advisors. So that's how he knows this <laughs> uh, all very passionately. So uh, just letting me speak about them. Um, so that's one where there is a lot of health outcomes and uh, a housing angle. And, and that has worked out really well that uh, it's a, uh, they, there is the, you know, households pay for it. It's not a philanthropic model, but then it's um, somewhat subsidized, right, through the connections and others that Habitat has in that. Right. Tim, could you share your perspectives? Yeah, I mean, I think... So my, my intersection with kind of housing and emerging markets goes back to essentially my first job in Cambodia working with first finance, microfinance, um, right out of college. And it was providing, or it is providing uh, small mortgages uh, for uh, first time, for the most part, homeowners in Cambodia. Um, at that point, uh, essentially a home loan would typically require 70% uh, upfront down payments. And then interest rate of around 20 to 30 percent per year, which priced it out of any Cambodian's reach. Average income at that point was anywhere between 25 to 100 dollars a month. Um, the group of initial shareholders, uh, mostly expats and Khmer people who'd been there for years, believed Cambodia was in an inflection point. There would be wage growth, uh, real economy growth, and that uh, that the financial institutions there were kind of overpricing the risk um, and were not really prepared to go through a process by which they could assess um, how a property might move from the informal market to the formal market. Um, and so I think that for me, seeing the first clients, uh, you know, firsthand, because it was a small loan book at that point, getting the formal title, getting a mortgage product to this house, which would have been unimaginable for them, you know, 10, 20 years before. Uh, to me, kind of started that journey of, well, this 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 can really be a transformative product. I mean, as in the U.S. and many developed markets, land and a house is the most valuable asset. It's the place where our wealth is is generally kept, and and um, we have for the long term. Um, in emerging markets, uh, I think the World Bank's recent estimate has 72% of people live on land they don't have secure tenure over. However, that's defined, whole other conversation. Um, and then in many markets, uh, that un kind of 
unsecured wealth that somebody has is probably by an order of magnitude uh, the biggest asset that they're going to have. Their inability to leverage that uh, for um, you know some sort of reverse mortgage, to build on it securely, to invest in it if you're a farm. There's all these secondary effects if uh, an individual has secure access to that and access to financing, and that's kind of seen as a formalized asset. Um, and so I think the more I personally dug into it and our fund did, we started to say, well, this is similar to other sectors, really kind of a cornerstone or maybe a keystone of a lot of other things we invest in. Um, but we didn't necessarily know how to approach it, right? Because when you approach housing, I think from a traditional sense, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is construction. Um, but I think as, as Mira, you can get into more. There's a lot more opportunities around that, uh, that that we've been able then kind of explore, I'd say, opportunistically. Maybe you could just pick up on that and talk talk about the other factors, uh, you know, the complexity as well as the opportunity. Uh, sure, sure. So, um, you know, uh, in the first finance, Habitat also has a, a debt fund called the Micro Build Fund, which, a, uh, which on lends to organizations like First Finance, right, that uh, to the consumer facing loan. So that's one aspect how Habitat tries to solve the various issues in the market because housing is always a multi-dimensional problem. There's always the regulatory bit of the policy and, and land being the you know largest issue where government and other involvements do come in. There is also the material and you know that those aspects of it. And then the supply side, right, with the builder and builder finance and, and all of that. And then there's a in the system there's a lot lack of transparency and you know issues that go along with that in the primary and the secondary market so it's a very somewhat of a complex system uh, and habitat has a larger ecosystem to have different approaches to uh, try to work on these things but for the fund itself um, we try to focus more on well what is somewhat simple that you know could be solved and scaled uh, in a way and we have found some themes that are interesting that way for example like you know building materials and building materials from uh, waste plastics or from agri waste and um, others so we we do try to look at smaller spaces where we could go in and 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 try to create an impact that way and and those are i guess you know trying to start from the periphery and edges rather than you know getting to some of these core problems which we understand are you know rather complex and and too much for one small fund or an organization to take on. And, and that's where we are also trying to see what maybe the partnerships one could bring on and right, who maybe the other co-investors who like, you know, as um, Tim was saying, um, in the land titling and other space, we do need other partners who have, you know, different solutions and approaches to come together to solve those um, issues um, as well. So, yeah. So before we... One thing I wanted just to uh, state that has been probably one of the most sobering uh, statistics I've ever heard in my life uh, when it when I heard about it and it stuck has stuck with me obviously number of people who have inadequate shelter in the world at this point roughly 1.6 billion people. I mean, just think about that and think about the human suffering that has or is on a daily basis generated by that situation. Um, so powerful, so sobering, so for many of us inspirational in trying to work to make a, make a dent. Um, you know, I mean, this is obviously something that is not going to be solved and it's going to be worked on over a long period of time, but it's certainly worth working on. Um, could one of you talk about this concept of minimum viable complexity, which I am not sure I can explain and would love to have you explain to the, to the group and how, it's, how you think about it in terms of the work we do? Yeah, I stole this from Gregory Landua from Regen Network, uh, who will speak here tomorrow. So you can we can we can get his definition. But um, <laughs> but I think the way you know for us we we like to think we are systems level investors. Um, 
recognizing we are a very small um, investment fund and that tackling things like climate uh, change and climate adaptation are the definition of systems change in all of its complexities. And so I think the, 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 the duality we grapple with is um, we want to try to make investments that we think have outsized impact, but at the same time we recognize that we're going to need kind of patholo pathological collaboration with government, other investors, uh, other entrepreneurs, uh, nonprofits in order to actually affect that. And so the concept we've uh, applied or played around with has been what's that, what's, what's the minimum viable, complex, viable complexity necessary uh, in a particular model or approach that will actually meaningfully move the bar. Um, so to give you an example, uh, you could have a one-off investment in a single insure tech providing uh, homeowner's insurance or some other single product. Um, that relationship to actually solving the housing market or leading to more housing, uh, construction, what have you, um, is, is quite far removed. But when we look at an investment thesis around that particular single solution, it's looking at what else would need to shift in the market, what are the other investments we might do, what are the other investments other players are doing, uh, like shelter fund, uh, so that this kind of fits within the ecosystem solutions. And I think that's the way we've kind of approached it, uh, as well as in single investments that are trying to do something a little bit bigger and more, more audacious. Uh, if they try to take 2 on too much, it's probably not going to be a sustainable model or a positive customer experience. But if they take on too little, that directionality, uh, as well as that kind of lack of like external factors, is going to be you know at least an impact and commercial risk. Uh, so that's how, that's the way we kind of frame, I guess, all these investments we're making, so that we can try to see where they can kind of have that outsized impact towards you know a bigger systems change. Mira, would you like to build yeah, on that? I, I think, you know, I, I haven't heard this word that much before in the past, but that's kind of how we also do uh, look at it, that um, things are very interconnected and, you know, you, you just go in with just one band-aid or right, one, one approach, which may not, which may look like it is giving you some results in the short term and making some progress, but it will uh, interface with some other solutions which may be you know uh, at, at friction with this and unless that is solved you may hit that roof on on scaling and so you just need to have this whole change pathway and right you know understand the various uh, systems at, at play here and uh, to see what is the ecosystem around the solution how is that moving and what may be the other players we may need to influence in in some way we or others that need to come in and influence in some way and yeah that that is where we we go long on a thing or or just say that yes this is a good idea but this is not an idea as time as can because all these other things have to come in place and and then uh, pace our investment expectation on the timeline for when things will happen according to right where not just this technology is progressing, but everything else around it. Yeah, yeah I was going to add one thing. I think that within the housing sector in particular, compared to other sectors we look at, um, there's, there is a requirement, I would say, of government involvement. Uh, there's also a tremendous amount of government uh, subsidy yes. and intervention for better or worse, depending on the market. Um, and there's a lot of companies that are playing within that which wouldn't exist in other markets because there are market failures. And so I think one thing we're always assessing and reassessing in the case of some of our investments in this space is they might be solving kind of a government or, or market or public failure, but should that continue to exist? Is it best for us to put our capital there? Um, where does that company potentially look at actually a nonprofit model better for this or some sort of data unit? So I think housing in particular is interesting because depending on the type of capital you're deploying, uh, if, especially if you have multiple vehicles to deploy um, or you have multiple angles like Habitat does, you can kind of look across the spectrum of investments that would need to make the housing market more effective and try to pull those levers. Um, and I think that you know one of the areas where this works quite well is when, you know again, you have a consortium or you have a particular fund, like a has done a lot of great work in this, uh, as does Habitat, where you can kind of look at a research level, like researching, okay, what are the data gaps, uh, working with government's cadaster systems or land registry systems to kind of get that piece sorted out, and then look at like all the different types of prop tech financing investments. I think it, it really does 
to some degree demand like a systems approach because otherwise it's very difficult to mobilize or feel confident about putting capital in any one of those. In the U.S. Uh, housing market is very different from the markets you are uh, investing in. And in the U.S., it's you know major construction, uh, major capital expenses, and is how would you characterize our non-U.S. markets in terms of their qualities and attributes? Yeah, so uh, definitely housing markets are very different across geographies and in some cases in different regions in these geographies and you know different, uh, the middle income uh, housing may look very different from the low income the urban from the rural and and all of that so so that's why one one just sort of needs to look at uh, what is the problem you are solving and and actually what is the solution and how scalable that is and we do find that some of the problems are not the same but they tend to rhyme uh, in the sense, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I've kind of seen this in, in Kenya, as in Myanmar, as in, you know, uh, some pockets in India and, and such. And solutions may differ in, in some cases because uh, what could work really well in, in uh, Kenya may just, you know, fall flat um, in the Indian context because of, you know, this interconnectedness. Do you, and, do and you like have a, an example, you know, a specific example that would make this clear? So if we look at um, uh, rental markets as an example, right, I mean, home ownership is, is one issue, uh, one aspect. So rental markets is one way there's a lot of, uh, where there's a lot of urbanization that's happening and, and people are moving into, which is happening a lot in many of the emerging markets, right, where there's a, you know, urbanization rate is very high. Uh, what are the rental market solutions one could come up with? And that differs actually, you know, I'll, I'll go into examples in India itself, uh, between cities where the tenant-landlord relationships and the agreements, because, you know, uh, housing is a state subject in, in India, the, the rules around uh, the agreements and the terms and, right, the issues around it are, are very different, and hence the solution sort of needs to be very different as well, right? But there are some common issues and, and common pain points, uh, which some of the digital solutions are able to solve and then leave that last bit to the local market. So, yeah. Your perspective, Tim? Yeah, specifically on like models that haven't been transferable. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, certainly. Well, so when we look at um, the spectrum of kind of housing uh, investments broadly, um, and Mira can probably do much better of a job than I about this, but you, know, you kind of have the funnel from the land construction and management, you know, all the way down to the financing, and then in between, there's how one manages rentals, there's secondary market for rentals, and all sorts of things. Um, but I think the one that we've seen that's most contextual is really around that land titling and formalization piece. Um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, 70% of the world's population doesn't have secure access uh, or tenure over their land, even if they have the building and have some sort of title in theory, it probably won't hold up in court. They're subject to being pushed off. There's all sorts of negative uh, ramifications of that. Um, however, every country in the world more or less has very different ways of how they uh, parcel out land, how they do legal registration. There's all sorts of social cultural aspects and how you get that through customary titles and West Africa versus formal titles in other parts of the world uh, versus Indonesia, where you have to have the Bupati who, you know, s signs everything off. It is incredibly complex. And so we've seen companies that, whether they focus on land data, like polygon collection uh, or land registration or land titling, uh, they've really faced barriers in doing something highly scalable just because it's so uh, it's so different across every context and even within a specific region, and the cost is typically high. I guess, once again, they're kind of covering for what is uh, a failure of the market, a failure of public goods to do that. Um, and so that's one where I think there's been grand hope of how this might be streamlined with technology across a lot of geographies, but the reality is that um, it's just too different and too costly uh, to find solutions that are truly global in nature. Are you optimistic? or pessimistic about the ability to uh, have uh, housing solutions for developing countries 
where uh, impact investors will move in that direction to be more proactive and get out of their silos and think of housing as a cross-cutting um, investment opportunity, uh, more going down through the passage of time. Are we at the beginning or is this um, a position that will not expand uh, dramatically over time? Okay, uh, I'm you know, definitely optimistic and that's because of all the pessimism around housing. Interestingly, right, because it's like the best time to invest is when there's blood on the streets, right? So there is a huge housing crisis. Uh, and as you said, you know, 1.6 billion people do not have access to um, decent shelter. And by decent, it's like there is, it's not like homelessness per se, but the quality of the homes and right, how vulnerable they are to any disaster, right? And, and there is the climate change, a lot more um, issues that we would see in the market uh, with, um, with floods and cyclones and, and all of that. Plus, as I you know, kind of alluded to, the urbanization is creating a different sort of um, crowding in, in cities while there is you know, space in other. And if the infrastructure is not developed, people will not have, you know, the quality of their uh, housing will be very poor. Uh, so there is a huge opportunity and, and it is a public good and you know, in, in the low income housing segment, definitely. Um, and the governments have not been able to deliver when things were a little easier and it's only getting harder with the climate change and right urbanization and, and uh, all these factors sort of thrown in. Um, and hence, this provides a new sector or a you know sunrise opportunity for people who say, okay, here is a large market. I mean, barring some cases, as, as Tim was saying in the land registry side, there are lots of solutions that are um, scalable, right? Like, you know, building materials, uh, there may be like some flavored uh, differences, but solution that works in one place could definitely scale across uh, geographies there. And these are materials that kind of bring a lot of these aspects of circularity and you know provide more thermal comfort or more affordable, provide local livelihood with you know local production and using local material. So there's a lot of opportunity to bring a lot of different investors who may be coming at it with different angles and use housing as a way to have the solution, right? So, and I think people have not been thinking of housing as an answer to some of these other issues or, you know, where does housing play in the um, change they want to see. But I think when that opens up, housing will become more interesting because it is a large problem and, and you know, there are new opportunities with the shift that's coming. So, yeah. Okay. Tim? Yeah, I mean, I think... It's no secret that some of the world's richest people made their money on construction and housing, right? Um, there's lots of negative externalities as a result of that. But when you just look at the figure that 950 million Africans are going to need uh, new housing construction by 2050, there's somebody is going to respond to that or some group is going to respond to that. Um, there are ways, like everything I feel like now, as we are in an inflection point, there are ways this can go in a, uh, a good way, a better way, or a very bad way. Um, but I think what gives me optimism is that there's been so much investment, largely on the background, backbone of relatively cheap cost of capital the past 20 years, um, in all sorts of circular economy housing, um, modular housing. Uh, there's been little bits of exciting developments in different types of financial structures around how you finance uh, housing in different uh, methods, and again, habitat, microbuild, you guys have been at the front of this. Uh, there's been a lot of interesting developments uh, in financing kind of public goods around land tenure data, GIS data, and so forth. And so I feel like it is slowly moving, maybe slower than we would like, towards a, cons a, a constellation of these different service providers being in a position to actually work together and meaningfully deliver housing that can be climate resilient and meet the demand of these markets. Um, but again, this to me seems like one of those where it's 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 very tricky because all this ecosystem has to be developed and kind of moving together. And if one's, if financing's ahead, but we don't have the construction, uh, if we push ahead with construction, but without care to who actually owns the asset and has the ability to own it, 
it, it doesn't really cre create the type of reality that I think would be optimal uh, for the people securing that housing. Yeah, just to add to that, right? Like, I mean, there is a lot of my, I mean, how, uh, the construction and the housing industry is, is large, right? I mean, trillions of dollars. But it's just the question is, uh, who, for whom are these homes getting built and how, right? And, and I think that's what um, provides the opportunity for us to change things here, yeah. Well, I want to make sure we have time for questions from those of you who are here. But before we turn to that, I wanted also to get one or two examples of investments that you have made to take the you know strategic concepts and focus on a an investment uh, housing related that you feel is, you're excited about. And let me start with Tim. Yeah, I can't just pick one, but um, <laughs> but I think that. So I mean, I, maybe I'll just pick a few layers really quickly. So I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, we've done two investments in kind of the property formalization space. Um, to me, again, this is just going back to Desoto's mystery of capital. There's just a massive amount of unrecognized wealth and untaxed wealth um, if you're looking from a government perspective. Um, in the land assets that 70% of the world has. Um, and so any sort of technology that drives down the cost to essentially formalize that and to provide security over it has massive impacts. And because it's potentially trillions of dollars worth of uh, either government revenue or individual revenue or B2B revenue, uh, it's a huge, a huge revenue opportunity to actually do that formalization. Um, so we have two companies doing that. One is Meridia, which does it through ag value chains, helping farmers uh, map out their land and get secure land uh, titling, uh, depending on the local forms. And then Suyo in Colombia, uh, which is doing that uh, mostly in peri-urban and ur urban areas of Colombia. Um, so that's like the basis property formalization. Um, then I think beyond that, we've done a number of investments in specific types of financial services that are touching houses around uh, different types of insurance for households. Um, and then a third level, um, we have started investing in companies that are looking at uh, kind of that um, data procurement as well as analytics uh, for urban design and other types of insurance products. So we have an investment in Cloud to Street, uh, which provides direct observation of floods, um, and then secondarily uh, provides credit risk analytics, or sorry, creditless analytics and insurance product design for floods. Um, why this is important is because a lot of uh, a lot of areas, of course, we know in emerging markets are at huge flood risk. Um, number one, and then number two, uh, governments have to be able to preposition aid uh, to respond to disasters, and then ideally. Uh, design urban uh, areas in, in thought more thoughtful ways or drive housing construction in ways that will avoid these types of calamities. So Cloud to Street provides that analytics data both to governments as well as insurers to essentially influence how housing market develops as well as provide all sorts of other types of insurance products. Great. Yeah. Good examples. Mira? Yeah, so uh, uh, Tim covered uh, Meridia, which is, you know, uh, Habitat is a co-investor. Um, land title is, is the basis for like home loans and a lot of uh, service availability so that's that's one that's you know quite exciting and that's a very scalable solution they are in uh, multiple continents with that solution and and you know those are the ones that are uh, very exciting one more i would uh, like to touch upon is um, uh, eco stp which is an investment in india which provides um, power free i mean zero power uh, water sewage treatment solution uh, and this is interesting because you know, low-income households do not treat their water that much, which leads to you know pollution of water bodies, which leads to health and other you know issues. Um, and this, and when they do, there is no electricity, or you know it does cost, so they uh, tend to not do that. The solution is zero power, and hence it you know helps improve the health outcomes, and there is power saving, so there is carbon reduction. So here is one solution that is very adoptable in rural and remote areas that solves uh, multiple issues so that's one that time you know very very exciting yeah. very exciting well i think we have time for some q and a and with help uh, i'd like to see if people have questions that uh, can be addressed uh, 
Um, so, uh, thank you so much for the work you guys do. It's re really admirable. I'm, I'm curious about um, your capital and, and your structuring. So I'm tr I've been trying to narrow it down, but if you could both just kind of characterize maybe as best you can, um, are you investing as a nonprofit um, or have you restructured in some way, you know, as an LLC or something like that? And, and then, and where have you, because at the, at the end of the day, you are a nonprofit or, or stemming from one or an NGO or whatever. So, you know, where have you, where are you sourcing your capital? Um, what are the return expectations to either your, your, your board, or I don't know if you have outside investors or not, or if it's, or if it's simply just coming from within a, cor you know, a corpus or an investment portfolio or whatever. So you basically get my drift. Uh, yeah. If you could both characterize that for me, I'd appreciate it. That is not one question. It's no, three. <laughs> I'm sorry. Very good ones. Yeah. Very good ones. Uh, sure. I'm Stephen Samuels, uh, Vice President at Volunteers of America. Yeah, I can go super so, quick. Non your structure, yeah. source of capital, return of capital expectations. Yeah, I got it. Um, so yeah, we are we are kind of the, the misfit venture capital arm of Mercy Corps, uh, which is a global nonprofit. Uh, we are Structures and LLC uh, Holding Co. in Delaware, uh, Mercy, wholly owned by Mercy Corps. All of our money comes in uh, through our current, or well, our first vehicle, which is an Evergreen Fund. All comes in through Mercy Corps, which capitalizes Mercy Corps Development Holdings. Uh, so essentially, we answer to a single LP, which is Mercy Corps. Uh, we have the ability to, uh, yeah, set our own terms. We just have to recycle the money. So that gives us incredible flexibility as fund managers to. Uh, target whatever risk return profile we're looking for as long as it fits within the impact pieces that we have. Uh, then we have another uh, vehicle we are uh, fundraising for at the moment, which is a more traditional GPLP vehicle. Um, that's not, we're not investing actively out of that one. Uh, then the third is a separate vehicle, which is a grant fund uh, that uh, allows us, and we've actually done more in the housing, well, we've done two in housing out of that. Uh, that allows us to kind of test out the application of and the impact of blockchain and blockchain derivative technologies in climate tech um, and financial technology. So that's grants. Um, so those are our three vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we also sort of have three vehicles. One is the micro build fund, which does the debt financing, you know, to the um, wholesale lending. That's uh, structured as an LLC separately. The fund itself is an on balance sheet fund, so it, you know it does not have a separate structure, the you know, uh, money comes from the donors. And our return expectation is it's an impact first return so the uh, so that we it, it should meet the impact goals and you know should be aligned with the goals of um, the organization. The financial return part, uh, we are a little uh, flexible and because we don't have a fixed uh, years of return, we have had returns already in the fund. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just for how does that help the organization to grow further uh, rather than, you know, we need to exit by this uh, uh, time frame and all that. And we also have a, a grant making arm through which we do test some ideas which are a little early um, through we have an accelerator program and a grant that sort of goes with uh, some of the theses the, uh, them have. And, and then when it's a little mature is when the fund can, comes in and invests. And yeah, we are, the fund has been in operation for five years. Um, and we have had investments that are like five years. So it's still, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So another hand, at least one, two. Hi there. Um, thank you so much. I have two questions. I guess you could pick one. Um, one, you listed that, you know, harrowing statistic earlier of like 1.6 billion people. Um, I'm curious to know what you think needs to be happening at different layers of the sector and the work that you're doing to actually get to solve that problem. Because um, I'd imagine it's orders of magnitude beyond where we are right now in resourcing systems, et cetera. So I'm just curious to hear in your biggest imagination of what would be required to be put in motion to actually solve that problem. And um, I'm also just curious, is the solution in access to ownership or is it in access to shelter? Um, and you know what's what's really the roadmap there? Oh, my name is Kat Lindroth. I'm with CB.O. Maybe I'll answer the 
second one which seems a little easier <laughs> use my imagination and leave the hard one for Tim here um, so I think it it is twofold actually um, it used to be that there is no access to housing ownership and that's where Habitat started with more on a focus of the ownership uh, model of housing um, but I think with more urbanization what we are seeing is uh, there are actually two problems and, and so that's why we also work on um, modular housing and you know other solutions which are a little temporary it's not like you're you know this is a home that I pass on uh, generation to generation 100 years sort of thing and and you know to like you need a decent place to live which you know is um, not too hot for you right you know and, and creating you all these issues uh, and giving you that space right for people to explore and live right so so it is actually two different problems that we are seeing and there are issues in both yeah hmm. that gives a larger problem for you to imagine <laughs> now Tim <laughs> yeah if I were to pick out like two cogs within the problem set around that um, the first one the World Bank has thrown tens of billions of dollars that I can remember, maybe a hundred plus billion dollars at like property formalization and land registries um, with relatively mixed success. And this is not to blame the World Bank. This is just a really hard problem. So I think the core data and mechanism by which land is, a, is, is, is attributed to a, an owner or community or, or to a government and then how that transacts is a massive issue that, that we as humanity need to figure out how to get good at, um, better at. And there's lots of bright spots, but I think that's a key one, whether that's for investment capital or some quasi public private partnership is a whole long conversation. Uh, we can have over beer, but like, I think there's like, that's, that's a core one for me. Um, the second is, I think the way I would pick out would be the financing piece. I mean, there's a, there's a pretty rich construction market uh, out there already. Uh, that's kind of outside the impact investor purview. Usually it exists in all these markets. Uh, there's better ways to do it. There's more resilient ways, and all these different things. Um, but that's 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 going, which is fantastic. And there's lots of great entrepreneurs, like Shelters Help Support It, and, and others that are out there. But the financing piece is is I think still one of the cruxes. And so I think access to affordable. Um, again, this is more on the ownership side. Access for lease to own, um, affordable long-term financing in these markets. Uh, uh, the ability to drive and crowd in more financing that is at a lower cost um, or appropriate for kind of the risk is a huge opportunity. So we, we just launched a pilot on their third vehicle on the blockchain one with Impala, uh, which is essentially testing this out. Like how could we essentially crowd fund uh, capital in order to finance least owned models in Mozambique um, and, uh, with Casa Real and Impala. Uh, so we're testing that out. And we'll see kind of how that looks as like a stream of financing over a five to 10 year period for kind of these mortgage products. Uh, but that's another one that I think really, there could be a lot more innovation within. So, so we have, Habitat has, oh, sorry. Uh, Habitat has imagined the answer, which is, you know, in, in three words is uh, the affordability of the homes, if the home itself costs less in, in some ways to, to build and deliver and access uh, to the people, you know, who, who do not have access, even if it is affordable in the sense of, you know, at the house itself may be priced at X, but, you know, do you have EMIs and right other solution? That's the access part. Uh, and then the third is the quality part, because, you know, you could get lower priced houses, but, you know, they may fall apart, right? So those are the three pillars which would help solve this problem uh, for the 1.6 billion, yeah. What are the solutions? We don't know, but yeah, those are the things that need to be answered. So we have time for one short question. With, a, a very with, long two, short, with two short answers. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Hansen, founder of Global Urban Village. I know Mira, we work together on some projects. Um, I find that when talking to people in the sector and outside of the sector, that it can be really intuitive to talk about building material innovations, like incorporating circularity into a brick, for example. That's easy to understand. Um, and you've touched on many of the harder to understand elements in uh, land entitlement, et cetera. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit to um, the decarbonizing solutions that have to do with building management or urban and density solutions. 
Okay, that's an easy one for 30 seconds uh, <laughs> each. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think, you know, digitization is, is one in the construction sector, particularly the housing, which would solve a lot of issues. You know, transparency being one, right? I mean, there's a lot of issues in, I mean, it, this, this may be an alien concept in developed uh, world, but in emerging markets, uh, lack of transparency causes a lot of issues and, you know, adds to a lot of, um, it, I guess, trust deficit, which leads to, uh, you know, higher cost of credit and right various issues. So that's one, you know, that we are uh, looking for solutions on. And there are many uh, with uh, the mobile phone and right, uh, uh, cheaper access to the uh, digital technologies that are out there. The urban planning and yeah, the architectures and all that is not an area we have looked sort of closely into, um, but because I have also not seen many investable ideas around it as, as a product, right? But that's the piece where it is, you know, you can push your thing this far, but then that's where in the, in the systems change, you will find that's where you will hit a wall and, and you need to work on that. And Habitat is not the one that could work on it. That's where you sort of need to bring in partners like the World Resource Institute or others, right, that we also do some work with to say, well, how do we work together so that there is a, you know, a fully systemic solution and not just one piece is like, this is the greenest brick that, brick that goes into this really bad overall system solution, right? So, yeah. If I could just add in, in the pilot I mentioned with Empower, I think part of the intention is to tie the financing to climate resilient housing, which means they essentially act as the property developer, which is then subcontracting materials um, and, and the right uh, type of housing that they feel uh, A, matches the income stream of the least owned product, uh, but also is the best quality possible house they can deliver uh, for the subshot they're targeting to, I think, Mira's point. Like, you could deliver any housing at that price, but they want to try to deliver one that as the lowest carbon footprint, but will also be kind of the longest term and most resilient. So I, I don't know if I have a great answer to it other than I think it largely depends on, of course, the demand of consumers, but also that the integral kind of property developer lens and, you know, are they pushed to drive down their cost or meet some regulatory standard? Or can you create enough consumer awareness or demand or financing demand that would, you know, allow them to choose essentially that type of construction versus another?